Our last topic in chapter 16 looks at free energy, that delta G, and its relationship to equilibrium. Equilibrium will stalk you forever. Le Chatelier is in your dreams forever. That says the equilibrium position of a reaction represents the lowest free energy available to the system. Reactions proceed to this minimum free energy. And we kind of mentioned earlier that at equilibrium, delta G equals zero. So we want to proceed to this state of low free energy where delta G will equal zero. Now they've got this fake reaction here, A or whatever our reactants might be, B are products. If we're not at equilibrium, and let's say we needed to shift forward, then G, the free energy of the reactants, which here is listed as A, would decrease as we proceed forward, and the free energy of the products would increase until we hit a state where the free energy of the reactants equals the products. G of A equals G of B. G is just this Gibbs free energy. And that's when the system is at equilibrium because we kind of mentioned this earlier as well. Delta G equals G free energy of the products minus G free energy of the reactants. So if we hit this equilibrium where the free energy of the products equals the free energy of the reactants, then products minus reactants would give us zero. And if delta G is zero, we are at equilibrium. Now, this equation is in the packet, this products minus reactants, and we had mentioned too, you can use this for delta H, delta S, delta G, it's great. This little booger is also in the packet. What if we have a K value? Ooh, what if we have an equilibrium constant? We can use that to predict if this thing is going to be spontaneous under the given conditions. So delta G, with that little degree sign, just means that everything is under their standard conditions, like standard state of matter, equals opposite RT times the natural log of K. Well, this looks like a blast, right? Okay, well, we should mention one thing. This R, R is a gas constant. In your packet, there are a couple different versions of R, and you have to be a little careful that you pick the right one. Some of them deal with, like, pressures. Well, that is the gas constant that we use in gas calculations in Pervnert. And it's got, like, pressure in atmosphere, or tor, or millimeters mercury. There is, however, another version of R in your packet. It looks like this. 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. This one, I mean, technically it's R, and R represents this gas constant, but it's not used for gas calculations. That makes zero sense, I know. You'll know that this is the R you use for thermal calculations because of this guy. It's the one that's got joules in it. Well, joules isn't something that I would use to calculate like a gas variable. Joules would be something that I would use in a thermal and energy calculation. So this is the guy for delta G. And then obviously T is our temperature, and it's going to need to be in Kelvins because this constant is joules per mole Kelvin. So if we had a K value, we could just do this equation. It is a plug and chug, and then we would look at the sign of our delta G, and we could figure out if under these conditions, especially the temperature given, would this reaction be spontaneous? If delta G is negative, we would say yes. Okay, so a couple things that can come out of this delta G equation. Now, a delta G could end up being zero, and that would be fine. We kind of mentioned if delta G is zero, the system is at equilibrium. Forward and the reverse occur at the same rate. And again, that little degree symbol just means that everything is under their standard state. If it's a gas, standard state would be one atmosphere of pressure. And if it's a solution, we would have one molar solution. That would be our standard molarity. Okay, so delta G could be zero, 
the delta G could be negative. We plug in our variables, opposite RT, ln natural log of K. If delta G ends up being negative, now think about this equation, products minus reactants. If delta G is negative, then it must be that this variable is greater. The free energy of the reactants is greater than the products. I mean, that's how it would get a negative delta G, right? Okay, so we want this to proceed until it's zero, until delta G is zero. Okay, so we need to decrease the free energy of the reactants. If I'm decreasing the free energy of the reactants, I want this thing to shift forward. So you got to kind of look at this equation, products minus reactants, if delta G is negative, the free energy of the reactants must be too big. So if I want to decrease the free energy of the reactants so that it equals the products, we need to shift forward. Oh, well if we're shifting forward and if we have a negative delta G, this would usually be a spontaneous change. Okay, that makes some sense, right? Our third option then would obviously be that delta G could come out as a positive value. And then if I look at my little equation here, how does this end up being positive? Well, now this value is greater. The free energy of my products is larger. I want this to be zero. I want the products to equal the reactants at equilibrium. Okay, so obviously we're not at equilibrium. In this case, I need to reduce the energy of the products. How do I reduce the energy of the products? We're going to shift reverse. We're going to consume product by shifting it more for uh, reverse toward the reactants. Now, if I had a positive delta G, and I'm shifting in reverse, that's often not spontaneous. It would really just kind of come down to you know, changing my temperature. Then maybe I could get this to run more spontaneously. Okay, so these are our three options. We're either at equilibrium, delta G equals zero, zero. The energy of the products equals the reactants. If delta G is negative, then the energy level of the reactants is too large. We're shifting forward. We're going to consume reactant, which is typically spontaneous. And then if delta G is positive, the energy level of the products is too large. So we're going to shift in reverse. To consume product, we'll shift reverse toward the reactants. Typically not spontaneous. Okay, so this might be my favorite problem in this entire study guide. I mean, this is really like chapter 16 in a nutshell. Anything you could possibly need to know on chapter 16 is all here. So we've got this reaction. It looks pretty simple. We're just going to form some rust, huh? Iron reacts with oxygen to produce solid iron oxide. Uh, using the data given, calculate the equilibrium constant ooh, at 25 degrees. Okay, so some of our uh, equations that we'll eventually want to use. The equation that gets me the equilibrium constant is this little booger. Delta G is opposite our T natural log of K. Okay, so I'm going to want to solve that for the natural log of K so I can eventually get the equilibrium constant. I'll need to use this guy to get delta G. H minus temperature times delta S. So I'll calculate delta G. We'll plug it into that upper equation and solve for the natural log of K. Okay. So I guess in order to calculate delta G, we need delta H and delta S, huh? It's like delta everything. This is so great. Okay, let's do um, delta H first. Super easy. Delta H. Products minus reactants. So my product, I have two moles of that iron oxide. Negative 
And again, I'll leave the unit out, but I promise I'll put them back in. This will just like keep my calculations looking a little cleaner. Products minus reactants. Now notice that this is solid iron and oxygen gas. That's their standard state. Their heat of formation is zero. So I guess if I wanted to, I could say four times zero for the iron plus three times zero for the oxygen. Now often they don't use that information in the chart, like they might not give that to you. Don't freak out. Pure elements will have a heat of formation value of zero. Okay, so we can plug this in our calculator and that's super easy. Delta H is just two times 826. Negative 826, negative 1652. All right, so now my unit. I told you I wouldn't forget the unit. Here's what's going on here. This is really two moles. This is the coefficient in the balanced equation, which represents a ratio of moles. And then this guy, the negative 826, that's units of kilojoules per mole. Oh, okay. So moles and moles will cancel and my unit here is kilojoules. Okay, so I have a negative delta H, which means this is exothermic, which is typically spontaneous. Okay, so there's one number that I will eventually need. Moving on. We got delta H, we need delta S. We calculated just the same way. Ah, uh, delta S. Products minus reactants. Two times my iron oxide, 90. That's my only product. Minus my reactants. Four times iron, 27. And three times oxygen, 205.0. Okay, so now again, the heat of formation for the pure elements is zero, but the entropy value is not. And this does make sense too. That gas, that oxygen gas, has a pretty high entropy value. Well, it makes sense that it would be higher than the two solids. So we plug this in our calculator, and I get delta S. Delta S is negative 543. Okay, now again, for the unit, this is really like two moles, and then these entropy values are joules per Kelvin mole. So I'd be able to cancel moles and moles. So my final unit would be joules per Kelvin. Now, delta S is negative, and we said nature favors an increase in entropy, a positive delta S, an increase in disorder. So this being negative, a decrease in entropy or disorder is typically not spontaneous. And again, we can kind of look at that equation and see, well, does this make sense? Yeah, it does. I've got four and three. I've got seven moles on the reactant side going down to two moles of product. So there's less total particles. I've got gas on the reactant side. I have only solid on the product side. So yeah, it does make sense that delta S is negative. So again, not only would I be able to like do this calculation, that's the easy part. But I would also be able to kind of interpret what that value means, especially the sign. Is it positive or negative? And is that likely to be spontaneous or not? Okay, so now we're ready for delta G. Now, we have a little issue. We had this earlier. Uh, or eventually I want to do delta G. And I've got different units here. I've got kilojoules and I've got joules. Does it really make a difference? I mean, unless they specify we want delta G in units of blah, it really doesn't matter. 
Now here's the only thing that I will mention. Eventually, when we solve for k, there we go, and we use this equation, that gas constant R, this little guy, is in the packet 8.314, and the unit is joules per mole Kelvin. So eventually, I'm going to want to use that first equation, and that version of R does have the value in joules. So I don't know, maybe it would be easier if we calculate delta G in joules. But if you use delta G in kilojoules, it's fine. Just flip the decimal here three spots. So I mean, you can really survive either way if you like have an allegiance to one or the other. All right, let's calculate delta G. Uh, I'm going to use joules. So let's use this as dun, 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 dun. Uh, yikes. This is going to be uh, a little bit wild, but we can do it. Whoopsie, delta H, negative. It was 1652 kilojoules. I'm going to make that joules. Yikes, that's a big number. And again, if that bothers you, you can put it in scientific notation, or you can use kilojoules. It's totally fine. Then just make note that you're going to have to change the value of R, or change your delta G when you get that far. Okay, so then I've got minus temperature. This is 25 degrees Celsius, or 298 Kelvin. And then I'll use this as negative 543 joules per Kelvin. And then this should work out really slick. Kelvin and Kelvin will cancel, so my delta G will come out in joules. And it's going to be, oh, actually not super crazy. Delta G is negative 1,000. 490, uh, oops, there we go, joules, negative 1,490,000 joules, yikes, once again, if you wanted to do this in kilojoules, if that bothers you, you could say like negative 1,490 kilojoules. If they don't specify, either is fine. And both of these come out to be uh, negative. And a negative delta G is spontaneous. So at 25 degrees, yes, this is spontaneous. All right. So now for the fun part. Uh, we want to calculate K. And again, you have a few options. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to use this equation, delta G equals opposite R, T, L, N, K. The only reason why I considered using joules above was because the value of R, that constant, is in units of joules. So if you look up R, 8.314 joules per mole count. If that bothers you, that you're going to have a large number, and again, you could put it in scientific notation. You could use this as 1, 2, 3. You could say 0.008314 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Either are totally fine, but just be aware that you're going to have to watch your unit a little bit throughout this kind of a problem. Okay, so let's get after it. And I don't care which value you use, you're going to get the same answer either way. So if I keep this in joules, I could go like negative 1,490,000 joules. That's a, there we go, a comma. Or again, put it in scientific notation if that number is creeping you out. Equals opposite. R is 8.314. 
Jules, Permol, Calvin. My temperature is 298 Kelvin. And then I'm going to solve for L and K. Natural log of K. Mm, fabulous. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Let's multiply and divide. Do some algebra. And I get... The natural log of K is approximately like 601. So now if we want to solve for the value of K, we would say K equals E to the holy cow, E to the 601st power. All you math geeks are going crazy right now. What does this number even mean? If you try to put it in your calculator, you might get an error message. You can try, unless you have like some wacko crazy calculator or well, maybe you're smart enough you can do this in your head huh uh, and if I like kind of simplify this it's like I don't know like 1.0 ish times 10 to the 261st power ha that number means nothing to me the only thing that I get out of this number is that K is Huge! Whatever that is, e to the 601st power, it's giant! K is big. Okay, well, what does it mean that we have a large K value? Okay, here again, equilibrium haunts you all the time. K is products over reactants. Over reactants. So if this K value ends up being gigantic, K is huge, we really have a boatload of products. This thing favors the forward so much that we would really say that the reaction goes to completion. They might ask you to do something like this on an AP test and say like, justify the fact that this reaction goes to completion. And they might hint at it and be like, you know, calculate the K value, justify that this goes to completion. When you get a K that is this giant, you wouldn't have to like really solve it, because again, some calculators are going to give you an error. If you go E to the 600 power, you could just leave it like that. I promise, they're, they're going to give you full credit. You could leave it like that and say K is so large that if the K is this large and it's products over reactants, we favor the product so much that this thing really just goes to completion. So if you think about it then, that's kind of why a rusty car never goes back to the original. I mean, this thing really favors the forward. It's kind of goofy that they even have this as a double-sided arrow. Because it really favors the formation of that rust, that iron oxide. That iron oxide does not decompose. I mean, not in nature. It would take so much energy to reverse this thing. I and mean, we'd need like a severe electric current or something like that to decompose the rust. If this kind of a problem makes sense for you, you are in such a good place. This has all the equations that you'd ever need to know from chapter 16, and they're all in the packet.